Right now, I want you to take your Bible for just a few minutes together. Um, you've heard a lot of stuff. I know that if you're at home, probably you're like me. I've probably watched a little too much TV. Uh, we need to probably cut some of that back. But, you know, we want to be informed about what's going on. And I understand that. I want to be informed as a minister of the gospel. But there's a, there's a higher information there's a greater information that I want to give you tonight, and that's the very Word of God. Never changes, always works, it always, always leads us to faith. So my prayer in this teaching and this message tonight, that this would build faith in your heart. This would drive out fear, this would drive out doubt. I'm telling you, there's a, there's a spirit of fear that is trying to come over God's people. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. The, the message tonight is this, remember, remember, just one word, remember. Tonight we need to remember some things. I, I, what I want you to know, now think about this, remember when the disciples were in the storm. All of a sudden, when the, when the wind was blowing fiercely, when the waves were billowing, Jesus was asleep in the stern of the ship and finally the disciples came to him and, and almost accused him don't you know what's going on here don't you and almost don't you care that we're perishing here of course Jesus rose up spoke to the storm and it became calm now that's powerful Jesus can calm the storm in our nation just by one word from the mighty and the matchless Savior, he can stop the storm. And they were just amazed. But Jesus said something to them, oh, you have little faith. So what happened? Why, why did the disciples react that way? Because they had forgotten who Jesus was. They had forgotten the things that they had experienced. And you know what? Often in a storm, we, we kind of lose our spiritual equilibrium. We kind of... You know, we, we, we can't see the forest for the woods, so to speak, or, the, or vice versa, however that goes. We, we lose our spiritual equilibrium. Another time when, when they were in a spiritual battle, Jesus asked them a question. Don't you remember the loaves and the fishes? How many you had left over? He was talking about one thing, and they were imagining another thing, and they were getting in unbelief again. He said, don't you remember... So tonight I want you to remember some things. Now, of course, remembering is an incredible spiritual asset in our spiritual ar arsenal, especially when we're in storms. Now, we're in a storm in the nation. The whole world is in a storm. I was on the phone with someone in another state just, just a few minutes ago, and they said these words. Could, could, could you imagine that three weeks ago, that we would be where we are, not just in our nation, but in the world. And I said, no, I really could not imagine how this virus has swept the world, as it's shaken nations, economies, it's shaken health systems to, to almost where they're, they're bending to the breaking point. Couldn't imagine it. Couldn't imagine it. We're in a storm. Some... It, it, maybe you're in a storm in your, in your individual family. Maybe there's fear about job loss. Churches are in storms. And it's in those times of storm and difficulty that you know what we need to do? We need to remember. We need to remember. We need to remember what God's word has said. Remember. Now, as I've said, we're, we're definitely in a crisis moment in our nation. We haven't seen things like this in my lifetime. No one that's my age has ever seen anything like this in our lifetime. Only those who are older Americans, our senior adults, have seen seasons like this. Seasons like the Great Depression. Seasons like World War II where, where Japan attacked our nation at Pearl Harbor, and then this nation ramped up, and for many years, even many industries were, were making war instruments. And thank God, the Lord was with us. And, and people began to cry out to the Lord, and, and people began to go back to church. 
And I think this is a wake-up call. We, we're, we're getting a message from the Lord that, that we need him as a nation. This, this nation was birthed as a Christian nation. No matter what anyone else tells you, we were birthed on the Judeo-Christian faith. The God of the Judeo-Christian God it was our God, Jesus Christ. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And what made our nation great was not our hard work ethic, not our ingenuity, but what made this nation great was God allowed it. God has allowed, God builds nations up, God brings nations down. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And I wanna claim once again that Jesus Christ is Lord over this nation. And I, I, I just pray and I trust that we're about to enter into a season of great revival that God's gonna pour out his spirit and many multitudes, millions are gonna to begin to call on the name of the Lord and the church is gonna become powerful in the nation again and will become a powerful church and a preaching church and a loving church. Pray the church would fill up again. The answer is the church and the answer is the Lord. We have to admit that our nation has drifted spiritually. Many denominations had drifted spiritually. Many of the denominations that were once very powerful and, and, and bastions of proclamation of the word of God now have become bastions of liberalism and, and, and social ideologies. We've drifted and we need to come back to the Lord. And I'm praying that the Lord would use this, that he would use this to bring us back to him as a nation. And he would use this to bring us back to him as the followers of Jesus Christ, and we would be who he's called us to be. I think that there's many idols in our nation, many idols that we have served. And you say, well, what do you mean, Brother Childs? Pastor Childs, what do you mean, idols? Well, just to name a few, the idols of greed, the idols of immorality, the idols of pleasure, to just name a few. And my prayer has been, Lord, do not let us go, I'm talking about spiritually, do not allow us to go the way of Europe. Do not allow us to go the way of the United Kingdom and England in particular. That once were, were bastions of gospel preaching, once were, were powerful, a powerful nation that sent some of the greatest missionaries that we read about sent them all over the world. And there was a day when, when the, the world, the sun never set on England's influence and now that influence has drifted. And I think if, if you, you could parallel the demise of Christianity with the demise of the influence of the great nation of England, of which we love, we need to pray. We need to pray. Just recently, Franklin Graham was going to go to England and the United Kingdom and he was going to do gospel crusades and, and simply because he had certain standards that the word of God holds those venues close to him. Not good. We don't, we don't want to go that way. I want to read a text to you and I want to quickly I want to quickly remind you some things. I want you to remember. We need to remember some things. I want to read you something that as I said, our, our, our nation's in crisis. The text of scripture that I'm going to read, which will be on your screen, you can, you can grab your Bible, you can read it with me. But what I want to tell you that this was written by the Holy Spirit, of course, but through a man who was also in a crisis moment. Of course, his name is Paul, and he's in a prison, and he writes to Colossae. Look on your screen, Colossians 1, verse 9. For this reason also, since the day that we heard of it, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness 
and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have received or in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Let me, let me quickly give you several things that I want you to remember. Number one, first of all, is this. We need to remember that prayer is the very foundation of the church and is the very foundation of every Christian's life. A church without prayer cannot legitimately call itself a church. A prayerless church must be a strange anomaly in the sight of holy God. And the reason is prayer must be a priority for our lives. It must be a priority for you as a Christian. You know, you're, maybe you're not working. Now you have more time to pray. What a blessing that is. You have more time to spend alone with the Lord, maybe than you have in many years. Maybe for many, many years. Breakneck speed, get up early in the morning, run to work, work all day, come in late in the evening, and you're so tired, you're so mentally drained that your prayer life has suffered. Maybe one of the blessings of this time is this week and maybe over the next few weeks, you will give yourself to the Lord in prayer individually. Maybe you as a family, maybe you don't pray together as a family anymore. Just before I left the house, I stopped. My wife is actually working from home. She works for a technology company, financing, technology financing company. And their office is just a ghost town and she's working from home and she has two computer, or two, two or three screens there and she's conferencing with the president of the company and all of this. And I was walking out the door and I stopped. I put my, my backpack down that had my computer and my Bible in it. And I said, sweetheart, let's, let's pray. Would we pray? Let's pray together. And we just joined and we agreed together in prayer. And she starts, she was praying more powerful than I prayed. She was praying in the Holy Spirit. And we, we agreed together in prayer there. And as we prayed there, in that agreement, I felt God's presence. I can't explain it any more than that. I just felt the pleasure of the Lord, the pleasure of the Holy Spirit that we were praying together as husband and wife. And maybe this time that God has given you to get your family together again to get the children together again, to cut off the TV and say, let's pick up the word of God over these next couple of weeks here. Let's get back to the throne of God. Why? Because what we need to remember is this, prayer is the foundation of the church of Jesus Christ and of Christian families. It's a priority. Do you realize it's our name? Body of Christ, yes. Sheep, yes. People of God, yes. Elect, yes. A lot of, lot of names. But you realize we're called the house of prayer. That's our name. House of prayer. That's our identity. And I think God is calling us back to prayer. Many people are afraid. And guess what? They're starting to pray again. I was right before service, or actually after service had started, I walked out to the foyer and I was just praying before I would come here to minister and serve you in the Word of God. And I saw a lady and she walked across our sidewalk out there and she was walking, just walking, exercising. And here's what she did. She, as she was walking, I could tell she was praying. She just put her hand, I, I knew what she was doing. She was praying. I think a lot of people are like that. We're beginning to pray like never before. Why? Because prayer is the foundation. And I'm going to tell you, you've got to pray first. Seek ye first. We need to seek God first. It doesn't need to be the last thing we do. It doesn't need to be the last thing after we've exhausted all of our intellect, all of our resources, all of our ideas, and then all of a sudden we start praying. No, no. Prayer needs to be the first thing we do. It needs to be our default. Especially in crisis moments, it needs to be our default. Effective prayer is prayer that is unceasing. Paul said to the Colossians, when I heard that you got saved, I didn't cease to pray for you. I, I prayed with you without ceasing. That's the kind of prayer that gets results. It's the kind of people that said, here's what God's word says about prayer, that God will answer our prayers. 
And in this season, we need people that say, I'm going to pray until heaven and earth is moved. I'm going to pray until God moves. I'm going to pray until the answer comes. That's true faith. Remember Elijah? When Elijah prayed, he went up and he prayed seven times. And the servant would come back and he'd say, what do you see? Nothing. Go back. He'd pray again. Come back. Say, what do you see? Nothing. Go back. Seven times he prayed. And then he said, what do you see? He said, I see a little cloud the size of a man's hand. And Elijah said, that's it. You better go tell Ahab. You better tell him to get to the palace. Rain's coming. And I want you to know, church, if we'll pray like that, rain will come. Provision will come. Power will come. Miracles will come. God will demonstrate his power. He's waiting on us. We're not waiting on him. If you think you're waiting on him, no, he's ready to move. He's waiting on us to believe and to engage in prayer. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. When, when crisis like this happen, people will begin to pity. When, when we begin to say, okay, let's pray, we're, we're pitied. We're pitied by do, those that don't know the Lord because we're seen as naive. Oh, that's all you, you so that's, that's your answer. That's your answer in crisis to pray. And they, because they think it's a waste of time because they don't know the Lord because spiritual things are foolish to those who don't know the Lord. But I want you and I to know this evening to be reminded of this, to be reminded that prayer is our foundation. It's the foundation of every church and it is the foundation of your Christian family and every, every believer. It's the most powerful weapon that you and I have. What will it do? The first thing it'll do, it'll affect you. Prayer affects you. Listen, no one can come into the presence of the Almighty God without being touched in a powerful way. You can't remain the same. After you and I have come out of the presence of the Lord, our vision is clearer. Our attitude is more reverent and more holy. When Isaiah came into the presence of the Lord, he said, woe is me, for I am undone. It's awesome to come in the presence of the Lord. When, when we come in the presence of the Lord, it, you're affected. Your, your, your attitude becomes reverent and, and f- in, in a re- fearful in a reverential way. You begin to realize that he's almighty, that he's awesome, that he holds the worlds in the palm of his hand. He's almighty. He's sovereign. When you come out of the presence of the Lord, your faith is strengthened. The mountains don't seem so big anymore. The enemies don't seem so threatening anymore. Why? Because you had a vision of the almighty God in prayer. Your joy is elevated in the presence of the Lord. The psalmist said this, in your presence is fullness of joy. Prayer affects you. But secondly, prayer affects others. Paul absolutely believed in the power of prayer to influence the church and those he was praying for. Notice what 1 Timothy 2 says. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Therefore, I exhort you, I encourage you. That exhortation is more than encouragement. It's a strong challenge. What what does he exhort us? First, first, notice, first, that supplications, prayers and intercession and giving of thanks. Notice, be made for all men, all men. Paul believed that prayer would influence those he prayed for. Do you realize when we pray, it affects the church? It affects the minister. It affects the deacons. It affects the worship. It affects the way the word of God is proclaimed. When you pray for your husband, your husband's affected. When you pray for your wife, your marriage, your children, the influence in your home is affected. When you pray, you can span the miles. There's no distance in prayer. We can go to the White House. We can stand in the Oval Office with the president. Why? Through prayer, because prayer has influence. Prayer is powerful. It affects you. It affects others. But it also can affect nations. Hear this. Prayer can affect nations. Now think about this. 
a praying church can turn this nation. You say, do you really believe that? Absolutely, I believe it. Not because of who we are or because our prayers are somehow special, but because of the almighty God that we serve. We serve the almighty God that's above all things. Prayer can touch nations. Notice this. He says in verse 2, pray for, not for, all men, for kings. Paul believed that prayer could affect kings. And for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Paul believed that prayer was so powerful, not only would it influence individuals that he prayed for, but it literally could touch a whole society where there would be quietness and peace. Wars would cease. Coronavirus would cease. Now think about this. When Israel was in crisis, what did the men of God do? What did Samuel do? The great man of God, the great prophet that led Israel. I'm going to tell you what happened. In crisis, he prayed for the nation. Here's the nation of Israel. And they're threatened by the mighty Philistines who've tormented them time and time again. And notice what 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 5 says. So Samuel gathered all Israel to Mizpah. And here's what he said. I will pray to the Lord for you. In other words, he's going to pray for the nation. And he said, verse 6, so, so they gathered together to Mizpah. They drew water. They poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And, and Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Now when the, when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines, Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, notice what they did. They were afraid of the Philistines. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And what did Samuel do? Samuel took a suckling lamb and he offered it as a whole birth offering uh, to the Lord. That's a type of the cross. That's a type of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our victory is the slain lamb. Our victory is not in our cleverness. But our, our listen, our victory, we, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. We overcome by the blood. And then it says in, that he cried out to the Lord of, God of Israel and the Lord answered him. What did, what did Samuel do when the nation was in crisis? He called out to God. He prayed. Prayer can touch nations. We need to pray for our nation. What did Hezekiah do in crisis? Hezekiah, the nation of Israel, threatened by the mighty, cruel, fierce Assyrians. Assyria had already encroached on the land of Israel. All the northern kingdom was gone. Every city triumphed over by the Assyrians. And now, as Isaiah prophesied, said they're all the way to the neck. And that that just meant that they were all the way to the gates of Jerusalem. We've been preaching on some of those gates. And here are the Assyrians all the way to the neck trying to strangle the people of God, trying to choke out the people of God all the way to the neck, all the way that is to the gate. And now they're standing outside the walls and the people of God are on the walls and the Assyrian and their generals are threatening, 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 saying, don't trust Hezekiah. Don't trust the prophets. Don't trust him when he says, trust in the Lord God. We've defeated all the other gods. And yeah, that's true. The Assyrians had defeated all the other gods because they were not gods. They were dead gods. They were idol gods. But we serve the true living God, the eternal God. And notice what Hezekiah did in crisis. And this is 2 Kings 19, verse 14, beginning. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers. And he read it, and Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord. 
and he spread it out before the Lord. And then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and he said, O God of Israel, O, O Lord God of Israel, the God who dwells between the cherubim, you are God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear and open your eyes, O Lord, and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the king of the Assyrians have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire and they were not gods but the works but the work of men's hand wood and stone therefore they destroyed them now therefore O Lord our God I pray save us from his hand that all the kings of the earth may know that you are the Lord God you alone what did they do in crisis? What men of God and the people of God have always done in crisis, they've called on the Lord. And in this crisis, we need to call on God like we've never called on God before. We need to cry out to the God that lives. We need to call out to our Jesus who's at the right hand of Father God. We need to cry out to God because he said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. He can turn this for our nation if we will do our part as the church of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you this. Some may laugh and even mock at a praying church, but I can assure you, dear ones, I can assure you this nation does not want the church of Jesus Christ to stop praying. It may be the prayers of God's people that are going to rescue us and are going to save us and are going to sustain us. So we cannot pray. We cannot stop praying, that is. We must continue to pray. Jesus asked a question in the latter part of Luke chapter, in the latter part of the parable of, in Luke 18, eight, uh, 18 verse 8. He says, well, I find faith on the earth. And that was in the context of that men should always pray. You know the story. The little widow that wouldn't stop praying, perseverance, importunity. And Jesus is asking the question when he comes, is he going to find this kind of faith? Is he going to find the kind of faith that causes the church to pray and to seek his face and to bring heaven down and to bring the strongholds of the enemy down? and the weapons of the enemy down, the strategies of the enemy down. I believe God, the Lord can turn this. The Lord can turn this. Now I wanna pray, I'm done. I wanna pray. I want us to pray. I want us to pray together in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, our Lord. I want us to believe God together. I'm gonna to trust God with you, your family, uh, but I think first we need to pray. We need to pray for the nation. We need to pray for our land. In, uh, in the Chronicles, Solomon, when he was dedicating the temple, in 2, two Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people which are called by my name humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then he said he would forgive our sin. Did he not say he would heal our land? I know we're not Israel. I know this, I know we're not Israel, but we are God's people. And there are some universal principles that always go over. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Any nation that will claim God and walk righteously and obey his commands. We need a revival of obedience in our nation. We need a revival of generosity again. A revival of holiness, goodness, love. Would you join me in prayer first of all for our nation? Would you join me 
in praying over our nation that the Lord would bring a great and mighty revival. There's, no, there's never been a revival without prayer. I think every revival in the history of the world has started with prayer. I want you to pray with me. Join me now. Father, we come before your presence. Father, we ask that you would give grace to our nation. I pray for a spirit of repentance across our land. Lord, many in our nation have, been, have grown up so secular. They wouldn't even know what repentance means. They don't, they don't even know John 3.16. There's an ignorance in this land of the things of God. Many of our precious young men and women have been raised without the knowledge of the Word of God. And in Hosea it says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Oh, I pray the knowledge of the Word of God would begin to proliferate across this land that every church, every gospel preaching church would experience a mighty revival of gospel preaching and gospel praying and gospel living. Oh God, pour out your spirit across our nation. Pour out a spirit of prayer, pour out a spirit of repentance. Use this crisis to bring us back to your throne. Use this crisis to bring revival. Lord, sweep many precious families, whole families into your kingdom. Let those who have fallen out of church run back to the church in a few weeks and never stop going again. Oh, Father, I pray that you restore us to you. And Lord, I ask that you'd let your blessing rest upon this nation again. As Lord, as, as Hezekiah prayed and as Samuel prayed, save us, save us as a nation. Save us, rescue us. We need you. Hear our prayers, oh God. Oh God, rescue us. Help us through this maze. Help us through this confusing time. As Jehoshaphat said, we don't know what to do. Now, we may in our pride think we know what to do, but Lord, our planning needs to include you. And I thank you, Lord, that I heard today that our president is consulting ministers of the gospel. He's talking with many dozens of spiritual leaders. I'm grateful today for that. Guide our president. Guide the leadership of this nation. Push back the darkness. Defeat the darkness defeat the spiritual wickedness that's arrayed against our nation. And Lord, bring us back to you, we pray, in the precious name of Jesus. Now, I also want to pray for maybe, I, I, I feel in my heart, I want to pray for those, just like a nation can drift. You know, Christians can drift away from the Lord. Israel, God's holy people, drifted so far away that they were doing worse wickedness than the pagans of that day. Christians can drift far away. It's time to come back to the Lord. If you're watching this or will watch this in any future time, I want to pray for those that are that their hearts are saying, I need to get back to the Lord. I need to renew my commitment to Him again. Father, I pray for everyone watching this or will ever watch this, that they're saying, Lord, I've drifted away from you. I'm doing things that I promised I never would do or never thought I would do. But Father, I pray that they would turn from their sin. Father, that they would turn back to you and they would say, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. I confess my sin to you. Cleanse me, wash me. Restore my fellowship with Father. Make me what you want me to be. Help me to serve you in the way that you've called me and created me. I come back to you, Lord. I return to you. And Father, I believe that you will abundantly pardon. Your arms are open wide. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name. Now. As I close this service, I want to, and this has been on my heart continually, we're battling fear, we're battling anxiety, you're battling fear. I say we, I just, I'm thinking of people that there's fear in so many people's hearts. But I want to remind you again that the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, 
and of a sound mind. I want you to know that you can rest confidently in His grace. I'm going to pray for that peace. Father, I pray for peace. You said you would keep those in perfect peace. Perfect peace is peace that is enough. Peace that's greater than fear. Peace that's greater than anxiety and worry. Peace that will allow us not to be distracted away, but to keep our hearts and our minds set upon the Lord. We thank you for this. We thank you. We thank you. As we conclude this, let's praise him. Father, thank you for this time that we could gather together as a church family. Lord, thank you for those that maybe are not our church family that has joined us. I pray that your mercy and your grace would be with all of us. Lord, we long to be together again very, very soon. Lord, whether it's days or weeks, we long to be in each other's presence. And Lord, we're going to cherish these worship services like we never have before when we get to come back together. We have to admit we've taken one another for granted. Father, I ask that your blessing would be upon your people. Now, church, I want to give you the blessing that the, the name of this church came from. The verse that the Lord spoke to my heart as we named this church, Trinity Life Church. And that's 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name, God bless you.